Good evening everyone and welcome to another edition of the Prince Soft Cover. The COVID pandemic came like a hurtling tsunami and changed the world we knew almost entirely. Normalcy is still a word with undercurrents of pining, but we have lived with it long enough to make an assessment of its costs, the healthcare implications and the economic repercussions. That assessment is exactly what my guest today, Jyoti Mukul, has done in her book, The Great Shutdown. Jyoti Mukul is a policy analyst and a former journalist. She is a commentator on the Indian economy and transport and infrastructure sectors. She has traveled widely to rural heartlands and energy installations in India during the course of her reporting career. Welcome, Jyoti. Hi. Uh, it's a fascinating book, I must say. Congratulations on having done such a wonderful job. Thank you. Thanks. So I want to start right at the beginning. Why is your book for Eric Massey's mother? Tell us a, a little bit about her. Uh, not that I knew Eric's mother, but um, there's a very emotional reason for it. Um, I was just 20 when I uh, lost my mother to an accident. So the pain of losing a parent um, uh, you know, when you are still in your 20s or early 30s. And uh, that too suddenly is something which moves me a lot. And in normal course, probably I would have dedicated it, the book to my, and it's my first book to my mother. But after speaking to Eric and uh, the trauma which the entire family went through be uh, because of lack of oxygen during the second wave, I decided that, uh, you know, uh, I should uh, dedicate um, the book to his mother because uh, I lost my mother long back and this was something recent and I kind of lived that trauma by, uh, you know, speaking to Eric and knowing his experience and how his mother uh, battled uh, COVID. So I thought this would be appropriate to dedicate it to somebody who uh, was in midst of this entire crisis. And yet I could relate to the whole uh, trauma. So those of you that are wondering, uh, Eric Massey's mother, Delphin, was one of the patients at Jaipur Golden Hospital uh, the night that it ran out of oxygen. And all of us in Delhi have lived those moments uh, sort of too real, it, they were all too real for us to forget. So I think when I talk about Jaipur Golden and all of that, that all of us will recall what happened. Uh, so Jyoti, tell me, uh, you know, as I was reading your book, um, I kept wondering that we have constantly looked at COVID from the health prism. But in hindsight, after two years of living with it, and after having seen what it has done to us, um, was it a health disaster? Was it an economic disaster? What, what is your assessment? So if you look at the entire situation, what uh, the country faced in 2020, and uh, mind you, COVID uh, was a new experience and nobody uh, knew what, mo for most of us, what a lockdown meant. We didn't know. Even, even the government didn't know what uh, lockdown was all about and what problems it could cause. Nobody had anticipated at that point of time. So if you see the numbers on 25th uh, March 2020, they weren't too high as far as COVID infections were concerned. So a uh, lockdown happened and that kind of uh, stopped everything. So from a manufacturing unit to transport systems to daily you know, businesses, everything just came to a standstill. So, of course, it was an economic tragedy and economic impact was huge. But slowly as, as we entered the lockdown phase and the, and the consequences became evident, things started opening up. But they could never really come back to that normal level as was pre-COVID, as we still see that economic activity is slow and that is not just true for India, globally also there were repercussions 
So I would say in 2020, it was more of an economic setback which we faced. But by 2021, I would also say that when the second wave came, it became a health tragedy as well, because as a country, we could not deal with the numbers which were, you know, just beyond imaginations and just kept piling up, uh, leading to failure of every segment of health infrastructure. So in that sense, 2020 and 2021 were different phases. Mm -hmm. Right, which actually brings me to the next question. You mentioned that, you know, when we had the first lockdown, our cases were not that high. We had just about, I think, 536 or something cases, if I remember correctly. Um, so, uh, you know, but also, like you mentioned, the first lockdown brought unmitigated economic hardships across the board. I mean, I think there was hardly any uh, segment of society that was left economically untouched by it. But over, over the years, actually, over the last two years, it, on multiple occasions, the government of India has always justified the timing of that lockdown by saying that India managed to defeat COVID because we happened to shut down at that point of time. Now, do you think the second wave demolished those claims? Um, sort of, and also, where did we go wrong, really, in the between the first wave and the second wave? Were we just lucky in the first wave, or or were we just caught napping in the second wave? What's your assessment? So, if you uh, go back and hear or read the speeches which came prior to the lockdown uh, from the prime minister. The lockdown uh, time was to be utilized for building health infrastructure. So the logic was that you keep people inside so that there aren't uh, enough, uh, there aren't so many number of infections uh, going around. And if you remember, people were being lifted from there. Those who were infected were just being taken away from their houses and put into a COVID facility. So the idea was that you lock down everything and you use the time for building health infrastructure, enough health infrastructure, so that once when things open up and if there is an increase in infection, they are able to deal with it. But what we felt uh, that, you know, unlocking started happening and there was a comfortable phase um, in, the, in the number of infections. But as 2021 unveiled and new infections came about, that uh, government no more wanted to have a lockdown. You know, they were they had burnt their hands. They were apprehensive. There were elections going on in many parts of the country. So most uh, the most political parties were against the lockdown, and uh, so that leads one to wonder whether actually it helped. Neither were the health infrastructure spruced up. You had COVID facilities, we did not have ICU bed, we did not have oxygen. You, there was a scarcity of medicines. Everything was in short supply. So uh, one wonders whether lockdown actually had benefits. And in, in one of the chapters in the, in the book, uh, I have mentioned about uh, economic survey of 2021, which uh, claimed a victory of the, which said that lockdown was a successful event and they uh, gave a lot of modeling and uh, arguments that how the infection rates were kept down. And then they came up with some stringency index uh, devised on uh, Oxford Balventic Schools uh, Index. And then they mentioned that uh, the lockdown was responsible for keeping the infection numbers uh, Low, but when I filed an RTI asking for details of uh, this exercise, uh, Ministry of Finance was not able to provide me with those details. So, which left me uh, wondering whether at all these claims of a successful lockdown were based on any uh, sort of, uh, you know, scientific reasoning or uh, data analysis. And uh, therefore, in that sense, of course, uh, maybe in initially lockdown was needed or, or uh, maybe a milder version of lockdown was where you don't stop long distance transport, where you don't hit people or, you know, chalan them or be very, um, very uh, aggressive with people who come onto the street uh, initially, just because you were trying to, you know, get, uh, get used to the situation. But in the long run, it didn't prove much helpful. Right. Actually, you mentioned that 
we probably didn't prepare enough. We had actually had full um, seven months, seven and a half months between the first peak and the second peak, which I think we just uses the use the first half of that period on bombast uh, about having sort of defeated COVID and the second half battling something which had completely gone out of our hands. So that's that's probably how we had uh, responded. But uh, when you say government did not want lockdown, um, it, it's very fascinating actually that over over these last two years, uh, governments and here I mean mostly state governments because after the first lockdown, the central government never announced any other lockdown, have sort of used the lockdowns as knee jerk reactions. Uh, without planning, night curfews, lockdowns, um, which just somehow one felt they came at will uh, and just just to show that we are doing something rather than doing something. You know, lockdowns became uh, like uh, sort of, you know, campaign rallies that, you know, I did a lockdown, I did the night curfew without any backup plan on what to do. So, what, what do you think about that, of, about the use of lockdowns and night curfews subsequent to the first lockdown as a COVID management measure? So if you see, uh, if you compare 2020 and 2021, of course, there was no la national lockdown in 2021, uh, but there were restrictions. And um, I believe in Kerala, for instance, there was a triple lockdown uh, in 2021, and which was, uh, which people said was more stringent than 2020. So Kerala government was uh, very strict uh, during the second uh, wave. So, uh, but in, in, in a limited uh, way, um, uh, the lockdowns did come and then there were these night curfews, which often, you know, used to wonder that people normally less number of people come on road any which ways during the night. So is it that uh, there is some kind of a scare or the COVID infection just multiplies during night that there is a night curfew? So all those kind of um, uh, re restrictions were there, which you could never justify, uh, you know, why. Maybe the, the pure only restriction probably the government should have or governments, uh, state governments should have put in place is on the number of people, you know, who are gathering for any, any activity, whether it's a marriage, whether it's an election rally or a funeral, those kind of restrictions could have been uh, there even during the second wave. But I would say people on their own also during second wave got uh, very scared, you know, uh, because in every family there was somebody or the other not finding a hospital bed or uh, fighting for oxygen. And the understanding of how lockdown, uh, what lockdown is and how your COVID protocol was much higher in 2021. So despite uh, those uh, night curfews of being uh, meaningless, uh, there was a certain restrictions with people themselves uh, imposed uh, uh, while you know interacting with the, um, the world outside their houses. So even if the government uh, curfew wasn't there, uh, it uh, wouldn't have really uh, mattered because people themselves were scared by 2021. Uh We've just had elections in five states. Election results have, um, I mean, BJP has done wonderfully, even if they have lost a few seats. Now, in your book, you talk about this worker from uh, Bengaluru who comes back home in Varanasi and he says, hey, it's just about election. It's, it's, a, it's a campaign issue. Elections are going to be done, so it And then people, and... In the same breath, he's talking about people dying of fever and all of that. And now these, and, and we had, all of us had reported, uh, talked about all these bodies in the rivers and all of that. I mean, those, those are the, those were horrible sights. But when the elections happened, how do you think, I mean, how do you, how do we sort of marry the verdict of these elections with what you have written or what we had seen at, the, at that point of time, um, why is it that people dying without treatment, without health care, uh, 
university did not affect the incumbent government. How did it happen? This is a purely academic question, not a political question. Yeah, uh, Avantika, it's very surprising that uh, quite a few number of laborers, migrant laborers who uh, had a lot of problems going back home and who suffered during 2020. Some of them I called uh, again in 2021 to know how they were. So uh, they were, uh, they had kind of a disbelief about uh, COVID. And uh, you could say that's because they, they are uneducated or not aware, but uh, I think uh, there was a general disbelief. And the whole thing of, you know, if you have fever, they will just take you away. And if the person dies, they don't even give the body back to you. Uh, they realize the gravity of that whole situation, but uh, somehow they, they lived in this world of disbelief. And maybe because at that segment of the society, you are more uh, concerned about the economic uh, hardships you are facing, about your daily bread, about your job, about your salary cut or not getting any work to do daily. They were, there's an Uber taxi guy whom I spoke to who, uh, who, who's incidentally a Brahmin and not uh, from an OBC or a lower caste in, uh, he's from Rajasthan and he drives the Uber in uh, uh, Gurgaon. Now he went back to his village uh, and he picked up some manual labourer job because he had a wife who was expecting and uh, so he wanted to provide for them. So the, uh, even that guy felt that, you know, uh, the economic hardships uh, was more than the health uh, emergency, I, I would say. Probably in the middle class and the upper classes, we were more bothered about our health, about the well-being. But for that segment of the society that lives on a daily income, for them, economic hardship was a greater uh, tragedy. But coming to the whole issue of why the same government wasn't there any anti-incumbency due to the health uh, issues and when the entire economic health hardships. Both of them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, as well as economic hardship, of course, when you, I, I really don't know how to explain this uh, whole situation. Maybe the, in, in, the, in the electorate, uh, when you go down to vote, there are some other considerations of religion, caste, or, you know, other uh, alliances which work. And at that point of time, when you go to cast your vote, you don't uh, realize that uh, the health um, infrastructure of your state is not very good and the COVID numbers were very uh, downplayed. The numbers were uh, shown to be less. There were bodies flowing. So uh, somehow I think then the priorities move on to uh, maybe caste and religion equations rather than, you know, uh, the more uh, fundamental issues of uh, a good hospital a uh, good um, uh, econ economic uh, opportunities being available in your state itself so that you don't have to migrate to another city and you can stay with your uh, family in your own state. Those issues uh, take, a, um, take a back seat and other issues become more important for while at the time of casting vote. Uh, so, you know, many years ago, this is pre-pandemic, uh, I, had a, I was talking to a politician and he told me, you know, I used to be very passionate about health and I built a hundred bed hospital in my constituency and because I would keep getting these uh, requests for admission to PGI yeah. Chandigarh Ames and all that. So I thought I'll build a hospital, a tertiary care hospital where people can go. And then he tells me when I went back to ask for votes, people talked about the roads that I had built. People talked about, yeah. you know, uh, the employment scheme, but nobody talked about the hospital. It was as if it was, I, I had not done it and I had done it with a lot of passion. So he was basically asking me, why should we spend on healthcare? Because it doesn't get us votes. Do you think that kind of mindset, and this is not a politician's mindset. He was telling me that people don't care about the hospital. Do you think this pandemic would have changed that mindset that would we as electorates, as voters, now demand healthcare more vocally and more actively after this pandemic, rather than build me a road to this village or build me an industry? 
see building the road i would say is equally important because right. that's a that's a crucial infrastructure you know if you don't have a proper road uh, accessing hospitals also become a uh, very right. difficult you know in so here it's an either or question yeah really as something that you should also spend on yeah basically yes the the tragedy avantika is that we are uh, we are into 75 years of independence and yet our health infrastructure is not up to the mark now i can understand that the numbers were overwhelming and any any kind of um, infrastructure would have failed but my simple question is that uh, if you are not able to you know if you created a covid facilities why couldn't uh, oxygen be provided in the beds which were there but were vacant because they were of no use it's like lying in your own house then lying in uh, in a covid facility because there is no um, uh, we have a huge population we we can build healthcare workers uh, workers who could support the efforts of uh, doctors in you know dealing with um, this kind of tragedy but if a tragedy like covid does not move you does not move you enough to decide on your votes or demand a better healthcare infrastructure from your uh, government then i don't think anything else can move you but it's a tragedy that despite all our education and all our uh, you know uh, years of independence we still do not think in terms of a development agenda which includes a better health facility better infrastructure in all respects you talk about electricity or roads or health school education those issues do not seem to be moving uh, the electorate right now uh, which is a tragedy you vote any party in power that's not an issue but you demand things from them you set an agenda for them so next time such a emergency comes and which keeps happening in this country in villages we hear of so many cases where uh, you know because of lack of uh, oxygen or something people just uh, lose their dear ones so that is very important uh, before i go on to my next question uh, i can't help talking about this there's a part in your book where you talk about using dogs for detecting covid that i found very interesting because is that i love dogs and i can see your bella here in your dp so so i really enjoyed reading that part but uh, coming back to the questions i have for you um, you know you talk about who throughout who you talk about who's role who's guidance throughout in the book um and i think there is there's this enough Uh, sort of unanimity right now on one thing that india did make some missteps during the pandemic whether we are saying that those were for this reason or that reason or uh, you know that, that's a different question but there were missteps there were things that we could have done differently uh, do you think they were mistakes that we made or did we just have the wrong guidance from the who yeah of course um, uh, i don't know about guidance as such because uh, globally who was issuing those guidelines and people uh, countries were trying to follow that but as a country as a whole you know we have a bureaucracy which is uh, very talented and uh, they have great experience right from a district level uh, you know official when they come into the profession and then up to the level of say home secretary or cabinet secretary so they have years of experience of dealing with public public infrastructure dealing with uh, all kinds of law and order situation so i would say it's a it, it's a failure of everyone put together whether it is bureaucracy whether it's the ministers the the uh, the overall leadership at the center primarily because if you you know that that the disaster management act was invoked and states uh, powers from the state uh, went to the center government so it was the directives issued by the center which were primarily being followed by the states and states were free to have stricter guidelines and not uh, uh, lenient ones so uh, the the um, if the responsibility or if the power went into the hands of the center government 
that when you hold somebody responsible for the failure, it would also be the one who enjoyed the power. So that's a simple uh, question. You know, you can't have power and yet, yet say that, oh, it is, wasn't my mistake. But at the same time, if the state governments had also worked hard enough to put a proper infrastructure in place during the lockdown phase and also subsequently, as you mentioned about six months lap between the peak of first uh, COVID wave, which I think was in September. And then when the second wave finally came, if the state governments had also put in some, enough infrastructure in place, probably the tragedy uh, would have been much less in 2021. My um, my only thing is that, you know, simple thing like uh, running of a railway, um, uh, Shamik special trains. There was so much trauma, so many people, thousands were walking on the street. But, you know, government chose, I don't know, for symbolic reason, they chose 1st May 2020 as the day they'll start Shamik uh, specials because it, it was Labor Day, May Day. Now, these kind of, you know, symbolic gestures, they could have started those trains 15 days earlier also. You End know, of uh, March, they told the court that there are no people, nobody is walking on the roads. This is what the yeah. government told the Supreme Court. That was end of March. So the, the, the thing is that uh, the book, you know, in the book, I tried to attempt. There was a, it was a very simple thing that if you shut all the transport net, uh, networks, what happens? What happens in a country where most people who work in other cities are dependent on railway for you know going long distances? A person from Bihar traveling to Maharashtra or that person I spoke to from Varanasi to Bangalore. So all parts of the country people move. If that suddenly stops and at the at top of it, there is a, a disease looming on your head. You can't meet your family. You don't have any income. There's this fellow who says, I asked for 15,000 rupees from my family, from a village to be sent to me. And then he withdrew everything from the ATM because he felt so scared that something like demonetization will happen to him. And he withdrew all his cash and he kept it with himself in Bangalore. So the, 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 the tragedy of the situation was that what took the uh, authorities, the government, so much time to understand why a simple train was necessary, you know. Uh, maybe they, the restrictions could have been put in place on 25th March 2020 itself, but maybe they could have given a little more time to people to move, to move wherever they wanted. They could have, you know, have things like restricted number of people entering railway stations or trains or making a dispensation wherein only, you know, reserved category people could travel, no standing in a train. So those kind of, uh, the, the trauma would have been much less. So uh, the book uh, primarily deals with that, uh, uh, you know, trauma of people not a being able to move and move when it was necessary for them to go. Do you see a problem in the Home Ministry taking the lead in all decision making rather than the Health Ministry? You know, policemen being roped in as healthcare messengers. Do you see a problem in that? See, uh, the way we are structured, the way the setup we have constitutionally or as far as the administrative uh, work allocation is concerned, dealing with the states and issuing regulations to the state or for that matter, the National Disaster Management Act, all that comes within the purview of the Home Ministry and uh, PMO, of course, was monitoring. Now, there were two parts to the whole thing. One, of course, was the health part of it, where the uh, health ministry uh, should have, or maybe they did, uh, take the lead of you know, providing uh, enough medicines, uh, providing for enough hospital beds, preparing uh, for uh, the situation uh, where worst could have happened and did happen. So they, they could have, um, but at the same time, whether to, uh, you know, there, there, there's a very um, uh, weird um, example I have. The day Shamik special was uh, started, people in the railway ministry were still in denial of the whole thing. So uh, it was kept as a secret operation and many were saying that we are not the ones who are taking decision. It's the home ministry which is taking the decision. 
so my point would be that uh, of course uh, the administrative responsibility would have been home ministries to deal with the state governments and to deal with the transport systems but probably they they could have executed it much better when they realized that the shutdown or the or the uh, lockdown from 25th march was the, uh, very painful for many people they were just walking towards the borders of uh, delhi and cities like gurgaon a long line of people were walking something could have been done to you know start the uh, the operation primarily train operations uh, earlier much earlier than waiting for a symbolic first may 2020 to come right uh you know that is all we have time for today it was great chatting with you jyoti and all the very best for your book uh, thank you avantika thank you for having me uh, on your show mm -hmm.